now. Sure. Okay, so welcome everyone to the online launch of Swept Away by Natalie Hyde. Uh, my name is Lakshika and I'm a publishing assistant at TCB and I will be introducing our guest host and handling all the technical Zoom features throughout the event. Um, today's event will consist of a conversation about Swept Away between Natalie and Sylvia, and then there will be time for questions from the audience. Uh, your questions can be submitted using the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen, uh, and the books can be purchased through TinLids using the link or the email that will be shared in the chat. Uh, Cormorant Books acknowledges the sacred land on which our company operates. It has been a site of human activity for many thousands of years. This land is the territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Patoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and steward the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, Toronto remains home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. And now I would like to turn things over to our guest host, who is an award-winning Canadian author for young readers, Sylvia McNichol. Thank you, thank you, Lakshika. And I just wanna mention that both Natalie and I are on the same territory. So that acknowledgement goes for us as well. I first met Natalie Sue through her fabulous book, Saving Armpit. Natalie's written over a hundred books. And uh, uh, I, I was also a fan of mine and Up the Creek. And so are my grandchildren. Uh, I got to know Natalie better through our writing group, BAM. So for the, the students out there or the future writers, we work, we meet every week through Zoom right through COVID. And I was privileged enough to be having sneak previews of this book. So Natalie is also her family genealogist, which you'll see in, you'll see evidence of in Swept Away. Uh, and she's traced her father's family back to the 1700s. She's the keeper of the bones, she's, she's called by her family. So far, she's found a ghost, a murderer, and a famous sea captain, and she's still looking for a pirate. So I have a feeling there may be more books on, on this. Uh, yeah, so uh, do you mind, Natalie, could you just, I know all about your book, of course, but could you tell us a little bit about the story swept away without giving away some of the mystery? Sure, so Swept Away is a middle grade murder mystery and it has to do with a young girl named Ruth Mornay, whose very best friend, who happens to be 52 years older than her, has disappeared, swept away by the Teeswater River. Now, everyone in the village of Pinkerton thinks it was just a tragic accident, but when B, uh, her name was Beatrice Payen, but when B's godson Saul and his father move into her house, Ruth finds out from Saul that maybe it's not what it seems to be in the village. And there's a mystery for the two of them to solve together. Uh, yes. Now, what normally we don't do this, but we would like to introduce one of our guest stars in the story, <laughs> one of the secondary characters, but she features a lot. Can you bring your special guest on board? I am going to attempt to bring my special guest. I talked Natalie into this, so if it goes well, and if it goes badly, really, Natalie, you should know better. Ah, <laughs> Dorcas, Dorcas, Dorcas. This, here we go. I just have to hold her correctly so she's calm. There we go. This is Dorcas. This is one of our Rhode Island hens here on our property. She's about a year and a half old. And her favorite treats are grapes and apples. And her favorite activities are taking dust baths and escaping from her run to come and visit me on the patio where I'm trying to work. And because she made the, uh, she was distracting me so much, I decided to just go ahead and put her in the story. So Dorcas features fairly prominently 
in the story as Ruth's chicken, and she even saves Ruth's life at one point. So this is my special guest. She's very sweet. <laughs> She's behaving very, very well. She is. I think she wants to be a movie star. <laughs> yeah, Dorcas, the movie star. Can uh, Maybe you could show us where Dorcas is on your cover. Can you show us her cover? Yes, I can. Now, are you going to let me do this, Dorcas, without flying away? Of course she is. All she right. Has grapes so in I, I put a little arrow there so you can see that Dorcas is even featured on the cover, which I'm hoping won't go to her head as she's flush with fame. <laughs> she gives us lovely brown eggs, too. Sylvia knows this chicken very well because she's come to visit my farm with her grandchildren and meet the chickens. So what do you think? Yeah. So do you, this is the question I get asked all the time, do you have any say in your cover? Who did your cover? And, and you know, tell us a little bit about how it evolved your cover. Because so I know first, first I'm going to let Dorcas go back to her coop. She's Bye, not going for chicken. <laughs> You want to go back? I think there's some grapes waiting for you. All right. Yeah. Oh, this is Dorcas. All you right. Say you love Dorcas, a bushel and a peck. This is from another writer, Valerie Sherard, out there. Yes, yes. Actually, I like, we have nine chickens. Um, they all have different personalities. Dorcas is the one who likes to escape. Um, but they're very sweet and they're very nice. And so I was really happy to put her in the book. And I was happy that she was featured on the cover. So to answer your question, as an author, we actually don't have a lot of control over the covers of our books, unless you're also an illustrator, which I'm not. I even draw terrible stick figures. So um, when the editor came to me, when the publisher came to me and told me um, who the illustrator would be, and the illustrator is Julie McLaughlin. And I happen to know her because she actually did the cover for another book of mine, Up the Creek. And I love her work and I loved her style. So I knew I would like it. Now, while we don't have any control over what the cover is actually going to look like, we are sometimes asked for some feedback. We're sometimes sent early drafts so we can correct anything that maybe isn't quite jiving with what's in the book because as the author, we know the story better than anyone. And that's what happened with the cover for Swept Away. I was sent an early version of it. And I can actually show you that if you want to see that. Yes, please. Right. So. Oh, be horrible share screen. Ta -da. Ah, there it is. Ah, is that right? So this. Far color on this one, right? Yes. Yeah, so this was just an early draft of what the cover would be, just to give an idea of the concept and what, what I thought of it. And of course, I loved it right away. You can see all the elements of the story. For those of you who've um, read the story, you can see some of the main characters there. And so I loved everything about it, except I noticed one mistake in it or one, one problem. And maybe somebody out there can kind of see it too, now that you've met my special guest. And that's that Dorcas was the wrong color. Dorcas is obviously a red hen. She's a Rhode Island red cross. So I mentioned that to the illustrator. In fact, I sent her a picture of Dorcas, which made Dorcas very happy. <laughs> and so then those are the types of changes that as an author, you can ask for them to make. And so um, the other thing Julie asked me was what kind of maple leaf I wanted, because uh, Ruth spends a lot of her time up a maple tree in the story. And she you can see her in her maple tree on the cover here. And so she asked me exactly what kind of maple leaf I wanted, because there's actually 10 different kinds of maple leaves in, on, in Ontario and in Canada. So I picked the sugar maple because that's the tree I pictured. So I'm going to stop sharing that for a second so I can share both. There we go. And so now you can see how it went from the first concept to the final cover. I just, I think Julie did an amazing job. And now you can see that Dorcas is in fact the color that uh, she is in real life. So that made me and Dorcas very happy. What about the title, Natalie? How did you come up with Swept Away? Well, it's funny. I, I actually didn't come up with the title swept away. One of um one of my writer friends did because I put out a call to help me. 
when you write a novel, typically you give it something that we call a working title. So you call your, your new story that you're working on anything that will sort of remind you of what it is. So you can find the files on your computer, but your working title often isn't the title that ends up on the book. Um, and in this case, it wasn't because the original working title for this story was simply Pinkerton. And that's because of what inspired the story. And that is the actual village of Pinkerton. And we happened upon the village of Pinkerton. Actually, it's less of a village. It's more like a hamlet by accident. We, we stumbled across it because my husband took a wrong turn driving home from the beach one day. And for us, when I say the beach, we went to Sobble Beach on Lake Huron, which is about two, two and a half hours away. So it's a bit of a drive. And he took a different way for some reason and we had no idea where we were and we came around this corner and um we came around the corner and ended up with with these houses around us and this antique store there and it was we had gone from all these like open farm fields to this little area with a creek and a bridge and these trees and these old houses and it was just such a lovely spot and so we pulled over and we went into the antique store there and I nosed around and I just became so inspired with the place because my writer's brain was thinking, wow, you know, what would it be like to live here? And I wonder what kind of people live here. Are they kind of quirky? And also, you know, what kind of dark secrets could be here? I actually have a picture of the antique store in Pinkerton. Um, so I'll show you. Here we go. And this is the, the building that we stopped at. And um, it actually is what I used for Bee's house in the story. This yellow brick building is Beatrice Payen's house. That's the little barn beside it. And I kept this in my head while I was writing the story. So the whole story of Pinkerton came about because we took a wrong turn on a highway. So oh, yeah. the title swept away was Lynn Leach's idea, and I loved it right away. And so that's what we went with for the for the final book. Uh, so Lynn Leach isn't isn't here with us today, but she's also another writer in our writing workshop. So I happen to notice on the cover also there's a little tag on it. In right here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did that? That's that's the unwanted clues. Can you tell us? what that tag means or a little bit about that? Well, when my editor read this story, he said to me that it reminded him a little bit of the Nancy Drew stories. And that meant a lot to me because growing up, I was a huge fan of Nancy Drew. In fact, I think I have, I have some of my original Nancy Drew books right here. I have all the originals. So I, I whoops. <laughs> So um, what I liked most about them is I, I loved the idea that there was this confident and intelligent girl detective. Now, I also read the Hardy Boys, which my brother had. So I liked those as well. But Nancy Drew was the mystery that sort of got me into liking mysteries. So when we did this book and uh, my editor said, oh, you know, it sounds a lot like a Nancy Drew book. We kind of gave it a Nancy Drew like title. So Ruth Mornay and the Unwanted Clues, um, just to give a little nod to those books that inspired me so much in writing this one. Yes. And what what do you like about mysteries again? There was something you were telling me that you liked about mysteries in particular. I like it because you kind of know you have to solve something. But you were saying that. Yeah, I, I just love that they're a puzzle, you know, that you have to think about the clues that come together and figure it out. Because I, I like puzzles of all kind. I like crosswords. I like Sudoku. I like them all. So I like sort of challenging myself to figure out to see if I can also pick up on the clues in a book or a show. I love watching mystery shows as well. Um, and just, you know, figure it out. It's that bit of a challenge. So I love the puzzle aspect of a mystery book. And of course, writing a mystery, having to create the puzzle yourself was also a great challenge. I had a lot of fun doing that. Yeah, so uh, I think that Ruth got a lot of clues that she didn't want from that label on the story. I wondered if you could read to us about those clues without giving this whole secret away. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, 
I know just the passage to read. So this part is very close to the beginning of the book. B has disappeared and Saul has already arrived. And Saul has told Ruth that Beatrice Payen, her good friend, has left her some things. And Ruth is excited about that because there's some things of bees that she really admired and loved. So I'm going to read two small passages. There's a slight uh, scene shift here, but this will give you an idea of why this is called Ruth Mornay and the unwanted clues. So here we go. In the dining room, atop the mahogany table where Ruth and Bee had shared so many cups of tea and peanut butter cookies was a cardboard box. Here, Saul said, sliding it toward her. Ruth and Dorcas peered inside. Ruth could see a small metal frog with a hose attachment coming out of his butt and holes in his back. A pair of very old, slightly yellowed, embroidered ladies' gloves and the dreaded human hair flower picture. Ruth was more than a little disappointed. There wasn't one thing in the box that Ruth had admired or commented on all the time she had been in Bee's house. Not one. I don't think this is for me, she said. In her arms, Dorcas clucked in agreement. Yes, it is, Saul said. Ruth peered inside again and with her free hand, moved the stained gloves aside, hoping to see something pretty or sentimental hidden underneath. Nope, must be some other Ruth. Ruth didn't want to be rude, but she also didn't want to take home this box of hideous and worthless items. Saul folded his arms. You're Ruth Mornay, aren't you? It was no use. She couldn't very well pretend she wasn't when every last person in the village knew she was. She was going to have to take possession of the box. Yes, she said dejectedly. She was surprised that the person she thought had been a close friend, a confidant, would leave her such a pile of junk. Dorcas wiggled in her arms, anxious to be on her way. Um, I can't carry both home. Will you hold Dorcas for me? Saul picked up the box. No, I don't do chickens. Dorcas looked right at him with her beady eyes and gave a low cluck. Ruth paused for a moment. She could see through to the kitchen where the kitten teapot still sat in its usual spot up on the corner shelf by the sink, but she didn't have the nerve to ask for it. Saul looked up over her head out into the distance. She predicted her death, you know. No, Ruth didn't know. In fact, she was starting to feel like she didn't know B at all. She told me to give these things to you in one of her letters. She said you'd understand. She said you'd know what to do with them. Sounds like B said a lot of things in her letters, Ruth said, with just a hint of bitterness in her voice. Then she heard a soft cluck from the reeds under the bridge. She ducked low and waded on the edge of the creek, soaking her running shoe right through. Ruth hated wet socks. It was just another thing to annoy her. She grabbed Dorcas and hauled her out. And I have no idea what to do with them, she said. Saul gave a loud sigh. Then think. She said you were smart. He turned to go. Wait a minute. Ruth scrambled up from the creek, balancing a squirming Dorcas. What difference does it make what I do with them or whether or not I understand? Saul looked straight into her eyes. Because when Aunt B predicted her own death, she said it would be murder. Mm. There you go. <laughs> call them an ugly box of junk. Yes, a, a hideous pile of junk. Poor Ruth. Now, I just thought, do you have any of your hideous junk around that you wanted to show us? I, I do. I mean, as an author, we often pull from things that we know or things we remember when we're writing a story. And when I was thinking of clues to give Ruth, I wanted to come up with some kind of unusual items that didn't look like clues. You know, it wasn't a magnifying glass or, you know, fingerprints or something. So I came up with some of the strangest things I could think of. And one of them is the frog sprinkler so the frog with the hose attachment in his butt and actually you can see it up here on the shelf whoop, right behind me 
this was actually my mother's and it is um, a garden sprinkler. So the hose attaches at the back there and water skirts out of his back. So that made it into the book. And um, you can see maybe behind me here is the little kitten teapot. So I had this for years and years. I thought it was the sweetest little thing. I just loved using it. I lost my original one. So I actually found another one and I was really happy to have it again. So I had that. Um, those were things that I liked. And then I also pulled some other things that, you know, I didn't really like. The, the gloves, um, I like to go antiquing. I like to go antiquing with some of my daughters. And you see these gloves in all the antique stores. And usually they're, you know, they're old. They're starting to get yellow. And they often have sort of like piping and a design on them. So I pulled that in too because, I don't know, not clean sort of old gloves wasn't that wasn't that lovely? It was something a little bit gross. And then, of course, there's the ugly human hair picture that Ruth hates. And that actually came from a visit I had to a castle in Germany. Now, this is not the one I saw in the castle, but I wanted to put up a picture. This is Sylvia found this for me, a picture of human hair done to make a piece of art to look like flowers. And when I saw the original one in a museum, I didn't know what it was. I mean, I do embroidery and things. I asked the, the guide and when she said it was human hair, I, I have to admit, I kind of gagged a little because it, I just find it so repulsive. So I wanted this to be one of poor Ruth's clues as well, because it made such a, a strong impression on me because I saw it years ago and I've never forgotten this, this hair picture. So uh, this made it into the book as well as one of the things that Ruth has to think about and deal with. So just lots of fun to use things around you and make them as quirky as you like. And, you know, I was so fascinated by it. I thought, you know, I had seen this picture a long time ago, but I thought, my grandchildren would come over and we would have an activity. We would cut someone's hair, maybe the dogs, and then thread a needle and try to do that. But Natalie assured me that it was a little more complicated than that. But I still think the teachers out there and the librarians, they could probably, they're clever, they could probably figure out a student activity using someone's hair. Yes. So I guess, I guess they could, Sylvia, but I'm still not a fan. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wow. find it gross. I really do. And so does poor Ruth. Oh. So really, you write about things that fascinate you, that horrify you. What other kind of things did you write about in this story that horrified or fascinated you? Is there anything else you can share? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of my interests have made it into this book, as you mentioned before, genealogy. So DNA and family history plays a role in this. And I'm a huge fan of that. I've been researching my family tree for years and years and uh, really enjoy learning about the people that came before me. So, yes, family history and genealogy make it in there. It also touches a bit on alchemy, which I'm interested in. Alchemy is um, an old discipline where the old scientists, but were scientists back in the day, tried to create new materials out of things. So the famous one is they always tried to turn lead into gold, and they were always looking for the formula for that. But I find it fascinating to think about how things can change with chemistry. And the other big one in the story, which has always been a fascination for me, are the Templar Knights. Now, um, maybe some of the people watching are familiar with the Templar Knights. They were a religious order of knights back in medieval times who were in the Middle East, who were supposed to be helping pilgrims get to Jerusalem for, you know, spiritual journeys. And um, the mystery around them has to do with the wealth they accumulated. There are lots of hints that they found some sort of amazing treasure and that they secreted it out of, you know, um, France or wherever they were, and that some of it may have ended up in North America. Um, those of people who are fans of the Curse of Oak Island or the mystery of Oak Island know that they think that perhaps maybe the Templars had something to do with the treasure there. So I love the idea of treasure hunts. I love the Knights Templar. I like family trees. 
I love mystery. And so I just kind of rolled it all into one in this book. I added a chicken and a hair tree. You know, <laughs> chickens go well with every story. <laughs> What I love about this book, besides uh, Dorcas and and the treasure and then mystery, I love the way uh, you deal with friendship first and characters, obviously. So Ruth to me is a very, um, what's the word, introverted character. She wants to be in the tree by herself. Her brothers are a pain in the neck. She doesn't want to be friends with Saul. And it's very interesting that her only friendship mentioned is one with a person who has been murdered, someone who's way older than her. So I love this idea, you know, the books that we often read, The Babysitter's Club, it's all about how somebody has a, a bracelet with half a heart and someone else has the other half and they're best friends forever. But that's not what you're gonna get in a Natalie Hyde book. Can you talk about your friendship? Um, Issues, maybe? <laughs> issues? Well, the thing is, I think that friendships aren't always straightforward. I think friendships can be messy, real friendships. I know sometimes you'll meet a person for the first time and maybe they didn't make a good impression. Or maybe like Ruth, you're dealing with something else at the time in the story. She's dealing with the fact that her good friend B is missing or dead and this other person comes along and just moves into her house. And then she finds out that B has been writing him letters and didn't tell her about it. She feels a little betrayed. So there, these are a lot of reasons why she didn't connect with Saul right away. And I think that's true of all of us. When you, you're making new friendships or you meet someone new, you might be carrying some baggage from something else that happened to you. So it's not easy to accept someone. But friendships aren't a static thing. They don't remain the same all the time. I think sometimes real friendships grow over time. And as you get to know someone and um, what they do, you know, their actions sort of reveal who they really are. That's when the friendship can really deepen or, or it can go the other way. If you can, you know, see who they really are and you don't really like who they really are, the friendship can kind of dissolve a bit. I think friendships don't always have to just be with your peers either. Like in this story, uh, Ruth has a strong friendship with B, and that's because Ruth struggles to, to get along with people her own age, but in B, she found someone who could really see her. She, she mentions in the book that she doesn't feel invisible to B, that B would talk to her. So I think we have to remember, or maybe even in our lives, reach out that, you know, friendships can cross all kinds of borders, age or areas or ways of connecting with people. And that's what she had with B. And that's why you know, it hurt her so much when B was gone and why she struggled to be friends with Saul. But, you know, their friendship grew again as as things happened and Saul's personality came out a little bit and Ruth's personality came out a little bit. Um, and I think that's how I think how, how friendships are in real life. And I think maybe that's why you connected with that, because it felt genuine, because that is how it is. Friendships sort of grow and shift and change as people change. So. Yeah. So yeah, our friendship, as I said, it started with saving armpit. I knew that I would like the author. You see bits of the author in the characters, obviously, and then through the other books. And then we did workshopping together. And then over COVID, I would bring every couple of weeks, a new set of grandchildren in to meet Dorcas and to pick out eggs. And we grew closer that way. And here we are now doing this kind of celebration of this wonderful book together. So I wanted this, this is my, one of my favorite parts in the book. So I've asked Natalie to treat her friend with another little reading, Natalie. Right. So uh, this is just a short little passage. Uh, Sylvia said it's her favorite. And I think this speaks to the fact that, um, like Sylvia mentioned, Ruth is a bit of an introvert. And uh, when you're an author and you write a story, it is it is a fact that a lot of you ends up in your characters in the story. Um, so I am in some of these characters. Uh, there's a little bit of me in Beatrice Payen. Uh, there's a lot of me in Ruth. I hope there's none of me in Mrs. Gorgonzola because I really don't like her. <laughs> 
But yes, and so you you often do that because it's easier to write a character who's a bit like you because you understand them the best. So Ruth is a little bit reserved. She doesn't throw her emotions out everywhere. And that's another reason why her friendship with Saul was slow in developing. She didn't, she doesn't rush into things with her emotions. Um, but that doesn't mean she doesn't feel anything. And that's true of any introvert you might meet. They seem reserved. They seem like they hold back. But deep down, they feel things just as much as other people. So in this little bit, this is a little bit past what I read before. Saul has told her, you know, that B thought her death would be murder. Saul has been writing to her. And Saul gave her these, these items. And Ruth has to make a decision about Saul a little bit here, whether or not she believes what he's saying, because it's a lot easier to think that your friend just suffered an accident than to think that someone came out and murdered them, because then you feel a responsibility to find out what happened and sort of avenge their death. So she has to make a decision here about what she thinks of Saul and what he's told her. So they are um, in Saul's kitchen. Ruth pushed back her chair and stood up to leave. She felt sure B would have hinted at something if she thought her life were in danger and would have given her some instructions herself. That's the kind of friendship they had. As Ruth put her hand on the doorknob, she made a decision. She spun around. Do you drink tea? She asked Saul. No, Saul made a face. Does your dad? He's strictly a coffee man. So you wouldn't mind then if I took that teapot, Ruth asked pointing at the little kitten teapot and holding her breath. Go ahead. Ruth went to the shelf by the sink and gently took down the one thing that reminded her most of Bee. She tucked it under her arm. As she went out the door, she said, by the way, I don't believe you. Ruth slipped back home through the woods, invisible to everyone except Dorcas, who raised her head as Ruth crossed their backyard. Safe in her room, Ruth carefully set the teapot on her dresser. For the first time since B died, Ruth cried. Well, I'm going to get my teapot down for that. <laughs> well, then I'm going to have to get my kitten teapot too. So uh, I, I guess I'm the black sheep of the writing. Or the black <laughs> of the writing. And of course, another thing that B that uh, Ruth liked, by the way, I'm using a school mug. Both Natalie and I have a set of these noble public school mugs, right? We all yes. have yes. Yeah. in their lovely school. Yes. Yeah. So the other thing that uh, I think it was Ruth really enjoyed were peanut butter cookies. Normally, if we had an in-person launch, you'd all be there. And for sure, we wouldn't have made peanut butter cookies because you'd be allergic to them. But in this case, we're taking advantage and enjoying a peanut butter cookie to <laughs> celebrate the, the uh, launch, the official launch of Swept Away. So here's to you. I think we should make a toast. Yes, yes, what's our toast? Uh, I think we should make a toast to friendship. To friendship, and there we go. There we go. Mm. Thank you all for coming. And now we will entertain your questions. Uh, so I will say that so far we have have questions from two writers, Jennifer Maruno and Valerie Sherrard. Uh, uh, Jennifer asked earlier where we got our teapot and, and I said that I got mine from Happy Glass. Uh, and I wish I could take a screenshot, but maybe I can in the recording. Um, and, and where did you get yours from, you said? Um, I found buying on um, just a marketplace. You can uh, get these. I did have one for years and years, and that was the one that was in my head when I wrote the story. Uh, this little one I had to go out and find because when I realized I didn't have it anymore, I must have gotten lost in one of our moves. I really wanted another one because it really is something that I just find so sweet. <laughs> this little kitten teapot. So Valerie Sherrard's another big famous writer um that's also with dancing cat uh she wants to know and and this strikes me as totally you should uh will there be another ruth mornay book it sounds like the perfect beginning for a series what do you think um there are no i have no plans i haven't done anything about it but 
I, I so enjoyed this setting. This is the first book I think where the setting came before the plot or the characters. Typically when I write, um, I think the characters come first. I imagine some people and then what could happen to them. But this, this happen chance journey to this place that we stumbled upon was so strong in my memory that I wanted to set the story there. So I love the setting. And I love the characters. I have to say, I, I'm really happy with them. They became real people to me almost. And so the answer is I would love to have their journey continue just because I enjoy spending time with them so much. And I think Ruth is the type of girl who could have an adventure no matter where she goes. Um, you know, if she were gone on a trip or I don't know. I, I think it's it's not out of the realm of possibility. I haven't done anything about it, but I certainly would like to spend more time with these uh, characters and this uh, little village if I could. So we have a congratulations from another uh, famous writer, Jeff Pinkney, or Pinkney, sorry. Um, and he was asking as well, is there a challenge using a real setting? I know for me, I've used Burlington as a real setting. And I make sure everything's exactly where it's supposed to be. And then the store closes and a new shop opens there. So what kind of challenges did you have with your setting? There are challenges. First of all, the real Pinkerton, while it had that cute house in an antique store, didn't have some of the things I had to put in the story to make it work. So there was no Sam's Gas and Go. There was no gas station or convenience store. So some sometimes you have to shift the setting a little bit, if, especially if it's a real place to fit your story. Secondly, you have to kind of think, well, what if someone travels there? Will they be disappointed that there isn't a Sam's Gas and Go? Um, that's a I bit ran out of gas there. Well, there you go. <laughs> if the Sam's Gas and Go had been there, you'd be okay. Um, the other thing is you do have to wonder a little bit then about the people who actually live there. Now, I don't know anyone who actually lives in Pinkerton. Like I said, it is so small. There's just a handful of houses. But you do have in the back of your mind a little worry <laughs> that what if they don't like how their town was portrayed, that a murder might happen in their you know, community and some of the characters like Mrs. Gorgonzola that I have created. So I mean, not that it should bother you. They know it's fiction. They know it's a novel. But at the same time, you kind of think, uh. so you are constrained a little bit by the reality of the place. But this is fiction. You are allowed to change things that you need for the story. But uh, I'm almost afraid to go back there, to be honest, because I'm afraid I'll be disappointed because it has now changed so much in my mind from this story that maybe I'll go back and I'll be looking for Sam's Gas and Go as well. So uh, we've gotten other questions again about wanting you to, to continue the series. Uh, a student from ICPS is wondering what your favorite book is. Now, first of all, I'm wondering what ICPS is. Do you know? Uh, no. Ooh, okay. We don't know. Okay. You can type that in if you want. That's our question to you. But it's anyway, public school. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> Sorry? Something, something public school, I'm assuming. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. BS, public school. Right. Okay. But what's your favorite book? My favorite? Well, of course, as an author, you know, my favorite book changes over time. But I'll tell you what my favorite book was when um, that got me really into reading. And that was a classic. It's A Wrinkle in Time. Ah. And before that, I, I would read. I mean, you know, sometimes you have to read for class. But when I picked up this book and I read it, it struck such a chord with me. What I liked was that the characters were a little bit flawed. Maybe that's why my characters are a little bit flawed. Meg was a bit dorky. She wore thick glasses. I wore glasses. She had a brother that didn't speak. Her father was missing. They were sort of outcasts in society. And sometimes I felt like that too in my family. So I, I related to her. And then she went on this amazing adventure. And um, it just... It just blew me away so much so that that's what turned me into a reader. And I think as an author, we are always hoping that maybe one of our books will do that thing that that one did for me, that it opens up this world of reading to someone and, and that book becomes the book that turns someone into a lifelong reader. So A Wrinkle in Time was the one that got me started, but I have a million favorites since then. 
Yeah, so Marcia Skripich, another famous writer visiting. That's oh. one thing Canadian writers are so, so, well, perhaps all writers, but certainly Canadian children's writers we're very supportive of each other and we're always interested in each other's books. But Marsha's not interested in your book. She's interested in your chickens. She <laughs> wants to know how long, how long have you been raising chickens? So we, I lived in town uh, most of my life, always wanted to move to the country. Four years ago, we made the leap to this farm and we have 25 acres. So one of the first things I wanted to do when I landed here was get some chickens. To me, that was the epitome. That's what a farm had. It had chickens. And we got our flock of chickens and um, I, I didn't realize how much I would enjoy chickens. Like you're, I wanted them for the eggs, but they have such personal personalities they're so fun in fact sometimes we sit outside and especially you know when they come around and we we call it chicken tv because we watch them they're just so funny they have they're wonderful so four years now we've been having chickens here and I don't think I could imagine not having chickens anymore because they're lovely I'd like to get more chickens don't tell Craig my husband <laughs> so another question is do you only like mysteries? So the only kind of, do you only like mysteries? <laughs> what do you think? Now no, I, I, I don't only like mysteries. As you can tell, A Wrinkle in Time was a fantasy sci-fi book. So um, I like them as well. But I do love mysteries. I, I still read adult mysteries. Now, I, I read a lot of middle grade too, but I even read adult mysteries and I watch shows, you know, Midsummer Murders. I like to read uh, Janet Ivanovich or... I love mysteries, again, just because I love that feeling of discovery and of working out the puzzle and figuring out what happened. But I do also like other kinds of books. I do like contemporary books. I like nonfiction dog books. books. Dog books? I love dog books. Uh, yes, well, Sylvia's written a wonderful book called What the Dog Knows. I do. I love animal stories. Um so no, not just mysteries, but I am a huge mystery fan. So yeah. So that leads to kind of a process question from Sue Kelly. And she said, is there a difference between writing a mystery for young mid-graders and other older readers? Because you read older murder mysteries right. or mysteries, because you have a murder in your mystery. I have mysteries and there's like a missing piece of art, but not a dead body. Uh, I, well, there was no body, if you recall. Oh. Yeah, we never found her. Next book, oh, we'll find her. We'll find her. Um, yes, I mean, I think the way you present a, a mystery often has to do with a crime or a tragedy. So right there, you have some uh, challenges to not overwhelm a younger reader, to not make it too graphic for a younger reader, but still maintain that tension and, you know, mystery. Uh, with older readers, you can go a little further with, you know, the types of, even the types of clues they might find or the things that might happen to them, and especially the level of danger. Um, for younger readers, you have to be careful, you know, you, you don't want to traumatize your readers. You just want them to enjoy the ride of figuring out what what happens. So I think that is the big difference is keeping in mind the reader and what they can handle in terms of story when you're presenting it. And it's actually more challenging to write it for younger than for the older, because you have a lot more freedom in what you present. So here's a Sophie's Choice kind of question for you, for those of you familiar with that movie. Um, what is the the book that you most enjoyed writing? Well, you ask any author and it's always the one they've just written. <laughs> or this, book, our writing, right? Or our writing in the middle of writing. Um, what so, are you in the middle of writing then? I, I am actually in the middle of writing a fantasy story, which is a great departure for me again, something I've never done. But because of A Wrinkle in Time, I do love them. So this, this is an entirely different kind of writing with world building and rules. So this has been a real challenge, as my writing group knows, when they catch all the mistakes I'm making. But the ones that I've written and published so far... The first book I had published, Saving Armpit, of course, holds a special place for me because the first book always does. It was such an amazing moment to hold a book in my hand that I'd written um, to have that. I mean, nothing beats that. I do have to say, though, for characters and setting swept away is right up there. I just 
I can't overstate how much fun I had writing this book and how much fun I had visiting with these characters. So the one that's special in my heart is the first one, but I think the one I've had the most fun with so far is Swept Away. So yeah, do you have any tips about mystery writing? Or I you... think for a writer like me, um, there are two types of writers we usually talk about, those that outline their story and those that don't. I typically don't outline a story. I kind of let the story reveal itself to me as I'm writing and, and sort of ask the question, gee, what could happen next? But that's more difficult to do with a mystery because you have this puzzle that has to, all the pieces have to fit together and you have to come up with a logical ending and you have to tie up all those loose ends. Otherwise your reader will be unsatisfied. So yes, you have to outline, I think, a mystery versus any other kind of writing so that you can get at least those elements to all line up and be satisfying in the end. So an outline is important for mystery. Um, keeping it fresh and new, it's so easy to get the same sort of clues or the same sort of characters because we all watch or read a lot of, you know, cozy mysteries and they can be very predictable. So finding something new and unusual is hard. And, um, and I think that's why I pull from things in my own life. So I try not to tread too much on what I've already read. And I, I read, <laughs> I don't remember how many Nancy drew. So you do get those formulas in your head. So outlining, trying to come up with unique ways. And, and often that might be your characters and your setting. So um, those are things I think are important when you're tackling a mystery, which although I think I had the most fun with it, I think was one of the most challenging uh, books I've written just to make sure all that came together in the end. So Joanne Levy, another famous writer, Hi, Joanne. She's saying, and, and I think you partially answered that, but maybe you could just repeat, uh, what was your favorite part about writing this story? I, it had to be the characters, honestly. Um, I always think it's a good sign when your own characters make you laugh. They become almost separate people to you. And when they would do something that would make me laugh, I think that was most important. So yeah, the characters uh, were the best part about writing this book. I, I wish I could actually go out and meet them, even the bad ones. <laughs> I, I really would like to meet them. So, I, And I think that also is the question as to whether or not there would ever be another book. I would so love to go and spend more time with them. So yes, the, definitely the characters were challenging, but the, the, the best part about writing this book. Yeah, yes. I mean, I feel the same that at the end of a book, you spent so much time with characters, and then they're gone out of your life, and they never write you or call you. <laughs> the only way you can act with them, and so I have been hooked into writing series that I've never really, really intended and gone on. I have an answer for you and for me. Remember, we were saying uh, ICPS. What was that? We knew it was public school, that mystery we had solved. It's Irma Coulson Public School. And they're here with Mrs. Magici. And we have, I'm sorry, that doesn't sound like I said it right. Um, writers never pronounce things right. We read a lot of words and we, we laugh about how we, we laugh at each other because we pronounce things wrong. But in any case, there's a bunch of questions from Irma Coulson Public School and I won't be able to get all of them. And some of them have been answered, like what was your main inspiration? That was that wrong turn. And oh, oh my husband's the, fault. The whole book is my husband's fault. <laughs> uh, he's a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> How long does it take you to write a book? That's a good question. I mean, I, these are all good questions. Yeah. Just some have been answered, right? How long does it take you to write a book? Um, writing is a game of patience. It, it takes a long time to write a book. And it's not even about writing the, the first draft, which is the easiest part, if you believe it. But once you write that first draft, you have to go through a lot of revisions to really polish that story, to uh, make sure all the parts are working, to make sure your characters become real, at least to you. So um, writing Pink, well, what I used to call Pinkerton. See, I still refer to it by its working title, Swept Away. Um, it took me... It would, I would say well over a year, a year and a bit to write 
the first story. Then I sent it through my writers group, which Sylvia is a part of. And they're a wonderful group of people who really help, you know, improve our writing. Um, I would say several months there, maybe four or five or six months there. And then when it got picked up by a publisher, there was also some more edits to do with them. And that took several months. So if you're if you're thinking of being a writer, and I hope you are, I hope lots of people are I'm thinking of it. Then, yes, um, you do have to know that it is it is work and that you will have to take on board some criticism and improve your work and that it can take a long time, uh, a year or more to get it down to get it to the spot where you like it. And then longer still to get it published. So yeah, it is it is a waiting game. But the good thing about writing is when you finished one story and you're working on different parts of it, you can always start writing another story. So all right. So now we're we're drawing to the almost end. So I'm combining a few questions. There's a question from Martha Martin about how you know your favorite book was a wrinkle in time and how Ruth is reading a wrinkle of time in the story. I, I didn't remember that. Does that mean you are also a big fan of Star Trek and Isaac Asimov's books? Or are those faves of other family members of yours? So since it sounds like someone you know. <laughs> um, yes, and well, I know Martha, hi Martha. Uh, yes, so there are references in this book to Star Trek. I, I am a Star Trek fan. I'm not a, a Trekkie per se. I haven't watched every episode, but I have watched them. But you're right. Some of the references in there I actually ran by some other members in my house who are huge fans of sci-fi and fantasy. Um, and that's something else you do as an author. You pull from the people around you, you know, to get other other elements in the book. But yes, Ruth was reading A Wrinkle in Time for a reason. She was also reading Anne of Green Gables, which is another huge favorite of mine. So as I said, a lot of the author ends up in the book most of the time. And so, yeah, when you read a book, you're 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 exposing yourself as an author when you write a book because a lot of you tends to be in there even if you don't plan to put it in there so good catch Martha <laughs> I forgot about that so this is from Anita, uh, Anita Ray Robinson who is a fabulous writer in our writing group and she's asking now this is a controversial question Anita I'm not sure that I should even give it to you oh. Nat but oh. she's saying are there any changes your editor wanted that you disagreed with? And if so, how did you handle that? That's actually an excellent question. It's a hard question, Anita, but it's an excellent question. I, I don't think there were any major changes in this story. Uh, there were a few changes with uh, relationships with her brothers and with Emily in the story. So, so um, because I focused so much on her friendship with B and her friendship with Saul, I had to, you know, really think about her relationships with other characters so they weren't flat in the book. So not so much in this book. Those, those to me, I could manage, but there was another book. I won't mention which one. And there were some major changes asked of me. Some of them I agreed with and others I didn't. And I did go back to my editor and say, I don't want to do this. And here's why I needed a reason. And I said, I, I don't like that what this would set up. And then I offered an alternate solution. I said, how about we do this instead? So we still, um, we still talk, you know, adjust the change that you need but um, we don't do it this way because I don't think that's going to work with the way I see the character. So you can do that. You can do that with an editor. If you really are thoughtful, you can't just say, no, I don't want to do that. You, you, but if there's a good reason, if you don't think it'll work with the story, then absolutely you can, um, you can sort of state your case and, and sort of uh, work out an alternate solution. And I have done that with other books. So there's a lot of gushing as well. So I'll, I'll pass on gushing. some gushing. Uh, in our writers group, I have to say the reason I'm laughing is in our writers group, it's so easy to gush when other people read their work and we're critiquing. And so we have a rule about not too much gushing because we know we all like each other's work. So not so much gushing. That's true. So this was from, uh, well, I won't even say who, loved saving armpit. 
and loved mine and up the creek. Now, and I want to say I loved uh, up the creek and mine because it had to do with gold mining in the Yukon. And I've been to the Yukon and I really love it. So I highly recommend it. Uh, there was a question and maybe we'll, uh, then there's one more note that I wanted to, to do with you. And, and it was from Chelsea was, she was asking, was it hard to write the mystery part Oh, and, and uh, did you have to start at the end and know all the answers first? And I think you answered it, but I forget. Well, that's actually, that's actually an excellent point. Yes, you're right. When I was talking about having to outline because you have to get all those moving parts together, uh, she's quite right. You, you kind of have to know the ending first so you can work out the weaving of the things to get to that solution. So yes, you, you kind of do have to work backwards with Mr. I didn't realize I had done that, but she's right. I, I did do that. You start at the end, you work out the outline, and then you set it all up with with your clues. So that was a great question. Yeah, writing a mystery is very different than many other books, I have to say. Do you watch Scooby-Doo? Oh, I loved Scooby-Doo. <laughs> I loved Scooby-Doo. <laughs> oh, well, that, that's just great. And they always now, have fun too, you know, finding out who did it, who was under the mask when they ripped it up. Did I guess correctly? Yes, yeah, Scooby-Doo was a lot of fun. So I, ha I apologize to a lot of people who I have sort of skirted your questions, but I wanted to ask you, Natalie, before you leave, as we sip on our last cup of tea and have our last cookie with our friends who gratefully, thankfully joined us. It was wonderful having you, even though we can't see you, we can just see your questions. I wanted to ask you, what do you want to leave with your reader? Was there a message that you wanted to give them? with your story? Well, I didn't set out to give a, a message. I don't like to moralize with my stories, but I think what I would like readers to take away is that we live in a world of wonder and adventure and mystery. And sometimes it's just around the corner and uh, life is exciting and fascinating. So I think, and that friendships come in all shapes and sizes. I think that's the other big thing from this book. Yes. And are you doing any signings? Are you, for example, going over to different drummer books and autographing all the books piled up there waiting for buyers? I haven't uh, set a date yet. I will be at Word on the Street in Toronto uh, in May. So uh, I don't know what else is coming up, but uh, I will post it on my website when I do know. So thank you very much. This has been a wonderful an honor and a wonderful experience uh, being with you to celebrate Swept Away, something I'll always remember. Um, I think that Lakshika will join us again. To well, I, I'd like to also say thank you first to Sylvia. Sylvia, you were so much fun to talk to. Honestly, no one could have a better host, make a person feel at ease and have a lot of fun doing this. So thank you so much uh, to Sylvia. And I want to thank um, Lakshika and everyone at Dancing Cat Books. But especially, I want to thank all the people who took time out of their day today to, to come on board, to watch and join. It means really it means a lot to me that you want to help me celebrate you know a book coming out it's a big deal to an author and especially my 100th book I mean sometimes even just saying that seems unbelievable to me so I really really appreciate everyone coming and joining in and your wonderful questions um, you've really made this a special event for me all right thank you everyone for attending and thank you Sylvia for hosting this event Congratulations, Natalie, on your book launch. Um, I would like to remind everyone that books can be purchased through Tinlids, and the launch will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. Uh, bye, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye, and thank you again. Bye.